And good afternoon, everyone, from St. Louis, Missouri, in the home of the Missouri Institute of Mental Health. I'd like to thank you for taking the time to view this web conference. I'll introduce our speaker to you in just a moment. But we'd like to welcome all of you out there. It looks like we've got a good crowd formed from around the country. We're really grateful that you're joining us today. If anybody's interested in CEUs for today's program, it's one of the links below the, wind, the video window. There's a link that'll take you to the CEU application. That's down there. We'll leave it live for a little while after the program. We'll also send you that link in a follow-up email. You'll notice several other links under the video window as well. And Daisy has been gracious enough to provide us with a few things. We've got her link to the Second Wind Counseling, Count, Consulting and Counseling. Counseling and Consulting, I got it backwards, yeah, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it's CC, so it works either way. But you'll see that link down there is also a separate link to, to her books and CDs, the store where she's got that stuff available. And you'll be after by the time we're done with today's talk, you're going to be anxious to go there and pick up some of that stuff as well. Also, a link is down there to the Department of Mental Health Spring Training Institute. I, would, I, I wouldn't be doing my job if I didn't do a shameless plug for the Spring Training Institute. Take a look at that site. And also, uh, if at any time you'd like to see her slides in a pop-up window, there's a link to those as a PDF as well. Those will be under that video window. So now I'd like to introduce Dacia Moore. She is a licensed professional counselor. She's an educator and expert, and she offers her practical research-based advice for working with bullying students. These strategies have been proven successful with some of the most difficult children diagnosed with attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, intermittent explosive disorder, and a host of other issues. Ms. Moore supplements research with effective, practical, easy-to-use solutions that help make lasting changes in teen behavior. They see her uses rational emotive behavior therapy and reality therapy as mo modalities in counseling. She's had the honor of studying REBT under Albert Ellis mm -hmm. and holds the advanced REBT certification from the Albert Ellis Institute. She is the president of Second Wind Counseling and Consulting, an author of Successful Choices Anger Management Curriculum, and her newest book, Why Are So Many Students So Angry? Some of you will remember that Dacia was with us once before. We enjoyed her ha having her so much. We invited her back. It's great to have you here, Dacia. The Thank floor you. is yours. Thank you so much. It is a pleasure to be here again. And wow, we have a lot of people who are watching. Hello to everybody. We only have one hour together. Uh, from 1.30 to 2.30. I have so much I want to share with you, so we're going to get going. Hopefully you have paper and a pen to take some notes because I'm going to give you some things that you can use. But I have a question for you, especially in light of recent events this past week. Why do students insist on bullying one another? Why do they insist on causing each other harm? Just Monday, there was a shooting in Ohio. And actually, I spoke with a colleague yesterday. There was a student who committed suicide in Kansas City, Kansas, because of bullying. Tragic, tragic. So the work that you are doing in your private practices, in your school settings, is so important. So I'm glad that you're here with me today. It is a human condition. Unfortunately, there, has, there have been bullies since the beginning of time, but there are strategies that you can use to reduce the bullying in uh, your circle of influence. So let's get going. Today you will learn counseling strategies to help reduce bullying behavior. If you have questions, be sure to type them in, send them to Kelly, and I will take certain um, pauses throughout our program today to answer your questions. As I was introduced, I'm Dacia Moore, you can call me Dee, and I love working with adults who work with students. I want to help as many students as I can. I primarily work with anger issues, and you know if you have been in a school or private practice for any length of time, bullying involves a certain level of anger. It could look like animosity or resentment on the part of the bully, it could look like um, depression and isolation on the part of the target. So let's take a look at that. But first we have to thank the Missouri Institute of Mental Health for giving us this opportunity. Yay to them. Be sure to check out the Spring Institute because it's really important that we stay abreast of all of the recent um, research that's going on and strategies to help some of our difficult situations. Now, I love the name of my company, Second Wind Counseling and Consulting, because we all need a second wind. When you're working with very difficult to manage behavior, you get tired. 
But second win is an athletic term where actually a runner is running a race, but if he just keeps going, he will get his second wind and successfully finish the race. So I want you to think about what the work that you do as a marathon. Reducing bullying behavior is a long-term situation. It's a long-term prospect because bullying behavior and the behavior that we have with some of our um, angry and aggressive students is behavior that is has accumulated over time, has been learned over time, and it's going to take time to reduce it. But these strategies will help you, but you have to use them consistently. Because we have some troubling times in our society today, and there are some troubling youth trends that I want to share with you in terms of statistics. Incivility and disrespect. A survey by the U.S. News and World Report revealed that 9 out of 10 respondents feel that the breakdown of civility is a huge problem and that nearly half of them rated that as extremely serious. Defiance. A New York Times national survey said that 93% of adults believe that parents have not taught children proper respect which leads to a defiant attitude. And did you know that about 27% of all crimes committed in the United States are committed by a youth between the age of 11 and 18? Aggressive behavior and depression. We know about depression. A recent survey shows that 20% of teens show signs of having a major depressive episode. So we have a problem with our youth today. Some very disturbing trends are happening with our young people. Of course, today we're talking about bullying. And if you're watching this program, you already know that bullying is a significant problem in our schools, in our neighborhoods, in our communities. The National Institute of Child Health and Human Development says that about one-third of U.S. students, and it might be more, but one-third of U.S. students report being either bullied or being a bully when this survey was taken. And cyberbullying, you know, these kids cannot stay off of their phones, can they? They, have to, they are attached at the hip to their phone. Well, there's a problem with that because they are also attached at the hip to the negativity that's swirling around on that phone. Cyberbullying, the recent White House symposium on bullying had a subgroup of cyberbullying and that research shows that about 20% of the 4,400 randomly selected teens reported that they had been cyberbullied. So we have what I call a perfect storm in our schools and in our communities today. It is the convergence of the influence of technology, the decline in positional respect, the uh, change in parenting. We've always had young parents, but we have a different kind of young parent today. One that believes their children more than the adult and also many times believes that they are their child's friend versus parent. That has been good in some respects, not so good in others. So what does the research suggest? The research says that if you're working with difficult behavior like bullying, like anger, it is important to use these two kinds of strategies. Now, REBT is a subset of cognitive behavioral therapy. SAMHSA did a study, the, the um, Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Association did a study, and 76% of the participants fared better using cognitive behavioral therapy to reduce anger and aggression than the control group. So CBT works with reducing anger and aggressive behavior. REBT is a subset of cognitive behavioral therapy. You probably already know that, but for those of you who might not, let me just share with you. REBT stands for Rational Emotive Behavior Therapy. So we are dealing with the cognition in the rational part, the emotional part, 
the behavioral part and the therapeutic part. So REBT is very similar to CBT, but I will share with you some of the distinctions. And that's what we're going to talk about in terms of strategies to reduce bullying behavior. Reality therapy is also another very powerful strategy that will help and it's a great modality when you're dealing with the bully because we're going to be talking about strategies that work with the target. Of course that's probably who you will see in your office and they're at high risk for suicide. We're also going to be talking about strategies that you can use with the bully like strategies from reality therapy. We're also going to talk about strategies that you can use with the bystanders. So let's make sure that we're all on the same page. Let's define bullying. What is bullying? Bullying is defined as when someone hurts or scares another person on purpose. Now let me take a chapter from my book, Why Are So Many Students So Angry? I have devoted an entire chapter to bullying and um, this is what the definition that I have in the book. Bullying is when someone hurts or scares another person on purpose. The distinction is it's intimidation and repeated harassment. Now I want you to get that. It's repeated harassment. These aggressive behaviors occur repeatedly in the context of an imbalance of power. So I want you to underline that as well. It is repeated harassment with an imbalance of power. Now, I wanted to point that out because you probably have encountered situations and you've wondered, is this really bullying? How do you tell between normal peer conflict and bullying? Because our students are aware of the media frenzy that's going on behind a bullying incident and so they may use that energy to say I'm being bullied and it might not necessarily be the case so this is what I suggest in your um, schools in your private practices after this conference schedule a time to develop some questions that will help you to dif differentiate between bullying and normal peer conflict. I will give you a start in just a few minutes, but you treat bullying a little bit differently than you do with normal peer conflict. So we'll talk about that in just a second. Let's make sure we're all on the same page as it relates to cyberbullying. Cyberbullying, of course, is when there is bullying that occurs electronically, cell phones, Facebook. How many, how many of us are tired of hearing about kids getting bullied on Facebook? Raise your hand. Facebook is here to stay, people. It's here to stay. It's getting bigger. He's going public. So we just have to figure out how to, how to rein that in. So cyberbullying is where there is willful and repeated harm through the use of computers, cell phones, and other electronic devices. Repeated. Again, it's got to occur over time. So how do we tell between the difference between bullying and normal peer conflict because children have conflict that's uh, well adults have conflict so yeah, <laughs> we all have conflict if you live long enough but there are ways that you can try to discern is this normal or not a couple of things that I want you to think about first of all remember I had you underlined re underlined repeated harassment normal peer conflict is generally um, there's an occurrence that happens, two girls fighting over the same boy. How many of us have heard of that one? There is a conflict, and then there's an apex. Um, they decide to stop, and then it dissipates. Okay. So there is a beginning, middle, and end to normal peer conflict. With bullying, it is repeated over time. So one of the questions that I suggest that you ask is, was the situation resolved? If it was resolved or it can be resolved, that might be a, a different question. Can this situation be resolved? If it can be resolved, then it might be more of normal peer conflict. If the person says, and usually it's a target who's in front of you, no, I, I don't know how we would resolve it. 
that is an indicator that this might be a bullying situation. How long has it gone on? How often does it happen? If it looks like it happens every day, several times a day, that might be more bullying than normal peer conflict. If it has happened for more than two or three weeks, again, it's looking more like bullying than normal peer conflict. And then the last question that I would suggest is, do you feel that that person had you know, power over you? And I don't know if you want to use those words, but you're trying to discern, is there an imbalance of power? Now, if you know the students, you know if there's an imbalance of power because there is the socially accepted bully and that is the hardest um, situation to deal with because you have adults who are reinforcing that behavior by looking the other way. Maybe they're the football quarterback. Maybe they're um, the smart kid who every teacher likes. If they're the bully, that's a little bit harder to, to deal with. Anyway, there's a socially accepted bully the socially rejected bully, and then the bullied bully. My point in telling you this is you know the children who are involved. You can tell if there's an imbalance of power, if it's a social issue, meaning that one child has more social power than the other. It might be more than bullying. Everybody write this down because this is huge in bullying, and I'm sure most of you have a great system of dealing with bullying in your school, but you have to have a way to report it because the adults don't look at the behavior like children do, like the students do. And you want to engage the bystanders so that they have a way to tell you this child is being bullied. I haven't heard of everything that happened on Monday, but I bet the students knew Something was going to happen before the adults did. You know that. If you've worked with kids, they, they're the first ones to know. You have to have a way for them to anonymously report their concern about another student. The best example that I've seen, Kearney in, uh, in um, Kearney, Missouri, they have an outstanding program, and uh, I've asked the young lady if she doesn't mind me mentioning that. They are very sophisticated in having that um, ability to allow students to report. They've got a wonderful form, and I would be happy to share it with you. You can go to my website and email me, uh, and I can give you her name. But they are doing it, and they're doing a wonderful job. So you do have to have a system in your school of how can students report bullying behavior because it is happening. That's why you're listening. All right, so real quick, four motivations of bullying behavior. In counseling, it is more effective if you target the motivation for behavior. That is the kind of the laser-like way to get to what's really going on. There is power and control, a motivation, group ganging up, Skills deficit and feelings of incompetence. Most of us think of the power and control motivation as the bullying situation. Uh, a child is, um, and bullying is an interaction. So one student is uh, socially accepted. You've got a target who a lot of people don't like, including a lot of adults. And because the bully feels entitled, he will bully that child. So that's the power and control. The group ganging up is also very common, and I'm going to talk about that today. Skills deficit is more where you have a student who is deficient in a skill, and let's say you call on them to read, and they are embarrassed. So they, because they don't like the way that they read or they don't read very well, and let's say a couple of students tease him about that he may in turn bully other students after the class is over because he feels insecure about his ability to read. That's skills deficit. And then feelings of incompetence, that's kind of like the rich girl going to, or the poor girl going to the rich school. She doesn't feel like she is adequate enough. She doesn't have what everybody else has. She gets bullied for not being good enough 
not having the material wealth that everybody else has, so she gets bullied for that reason. Uh, so primarily the, the, the group ganging up and the power and control are what we're going to talk about today. So I want to know what tools, this is a question for you, what tools do you have in your toolbox? This is your toolbox. If you have a home or an apartment, you probably have a toolbox that has some very basic tools in it. Hammer, uh, screw, Phillips screwdriver, flathead screwdriver, maybe a wrench, right? Okay. You have some very basic tools that I bet you know about in counseling students and maybe some of them you have forgotten or stopped using. They're your foundational tools. So what I am going to suggest to you today, what we're going to talk about today could be some tools that you already know about, but you have stopped using them. But you can't do that. I also want to give you new tools to use because the best tools that you have are the tools that you use. All right, so the, the first foundational tools. Does everybody have this book? The Relaxation and Stress Reduction Workbook. If you don't have this book, you need to purchase it. It is um, authored by Martha Davis, Elizabeth Robbins, and it is full. You see how thick it is. It is full of wonderful strategies, but a foundational tool that all of us should be using in bullying situations is teaching our students deep breathing. Now, a lot of students know the words deep breathing, but when you ask them to do it, they go, <laughs> well, if you breathe like that, you're going to hyperventilate, and you're also going to make yourself excited. The point of deep breathing, people, is to what? Calm down. So my suggestion to you, this should be the hammer in your toolbox, the primary tool that you use is to teach your, all your students, whether that's in a classroom setting and you do it once a week, or whether that's one-on-one -on -one in your private offices, teach them deep breathing. Teach them the proper way to um, inhale, hold it for a minute, and then release. Because you cannot have anxiety and fear and relaxation in the same body. As an example, I'll call my client um, Elizabeth, beautiful girl from a suburb in Kansas City. Her mother was very concerned about her because she was looking depressed, she was uh, sad all the time, and she is actually the one who asked her mother, Mom, I need counseling. I'm really depressed because I'm getting bullied at school. Well, when she came to me, I looked at her because she's a beautiful girl. She reminds me of Barbie, except she had dark hair, just gorgeous. And I'm thinking to myself, why is she here in front of me? She doesn't look depressed. Well, of course, you know that's ridiculous. But anyway, that was my subjective thought when she first came in. Well, she began to tell me about um, an experience that she had of being on the dance team. Some girls decided not to like her, probably because she was so pretty and they began to blackball her, relational bullying. They talked about her, they spread rumors about her. So when she entered high school with these girls, she had started from a deficit. From day one of high school, and if, well you know how important that is, you want to fit in, you want to belong. From day one of high school, she was being bullied by these girls and eventually that bullying began to spread and she got depressed and of course by the time that she came to see me she was having crying spells several times a day. One of the first tools that I taught her was how to deep breathe properly and then we talked about the my special place visualization which is one other step in deep breathing. Very simple and I know that all of you know what what I'm talking about. All of you know how to do a deep breathing exercise but are you teaching your students? So after she began to work and do her deep breathing on a regular basis, she was able to recover more quickly from her 
uh, bullying episodes. Now, of course, she still had some trouble, and there are other strategies that I taught her, but that's the first one I taught her is how to manage her anxiety because she would become fearful as they approached the school in the morning. She didn't want to get out of the car. She didn't want to go into the school. And certainly she didn't want to go to her locker. So the deep breathing helped her to at least bring her anxiety down a notch to manage. And the visualization helped her to think about something different rather than is everybody talking about me? Because that was one of her um, cognitions. Everybody's talking about me. Everybody knows. Nobody likes me. The next thing I want to share with you is Think Blue Wave. Now, I have an activity manual that I um, have on my website. It's specifically for bullying and anger management issues. And this particular uh, laminate, laminated photo is in... Doesn't that look wonderful? Boy, if, if you're in a cold uh, climate right now, this looks really inviting. And it's a guy on a blue wave. I taught her this strategy as well. And what we talked about is Elizabeth, of course, that's not her name. Elizabeth, you have to stay on your board. Okay? Staying on your board is our language to say, don't allow the wave of emotion the wave of bullying, the wave of fear that you might feel in the face of these girls who continue to harass you, don't allow you to knock that off your board. So that was one way that we used it. A second way is that we talked about an acronym that she created for Blue Wave. What did that mean to her? So she would repeat that to herself. She would visualize the Blue Wave. That would help her to manage herself. Another way that you can use it is with the bully. Now, the bully is usually the aggressor, and he doesn't think he's doing anything wrong. And I'm just using him. Of course, we have lots of girl bullies. They're worse than the boys. But anyway, you can have him stay on his board of not bullying. Did you stay on your board today? Did you stay away from this person who just causes you a lot of uh, disgust? Did you close your mouth and just keep it moving. Were you able to stay on your board? So you can use uh, this particular strategy a lot of different ways and it can be very helpful to you. Just real quick strategies. One last foundational strategy before we get into some really meaty REBT information is the anger meter. Now I have an anger meter, I have a frustration meter, and I have a depression meter. <laughs> I want to show you, and I'll just put it up here, Tom. Can I just set it right here? I want to show you an example of my depression meter because I wonder if the child who did all the shooting on um, Monday, if anybody had checked in with him on a regular basis and asked him how he was doing. Now, if you know me, and there are many people who are on this um, web conference that know me. Hi everybody that I know. You know that I use the anger meter in just about every training that I do. It's a simple tool but it gives you information. It is an assessment tool that I encourage you to use in bullying situations. Number one, for the target you can ask them how frustrated are you or how angry are you? Give me the number where you are in terms of how you feel. Sometimes we can look at clients. As a matter of fact, I've had so many clients in my office and they will appear to be calm and I'll say, okay, what number are you on the frustration meter? Well, Miss D, I'm at a 10. I had no idea. They looked fine. That's what's happening in our schools. Teachers are so busy and I get that. There are multiple priorities and lots of other things going on and sometimes you miss signs asking them real quick, hey, where are you on this meter today? Well, I'm at a nine. That gives you information. You need to pull that student. You know what? Come talk to me in just a few minutes. Come talk to me when you have an opportunity. Instead of going to your gym class, come see me. That gives you information real quick and dirty to assess where they are in their feeling. In terms of classroom, you can teach this to your classroom. 
you can have this posted on the board and at the beginning of a class you can say how's everybody doing is there anybody above an eight you can use it in your um, in your classrooms to ask other students if you know of anybody who is on who is more than an eight on the frustration meter today be sure and fill out the form and let us know you have to begin to use the tools that you have or the tools that you purchase in order to get information because that's what's not happening we are busy 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 with our uh, our tasks our priorities and we miss sometimes where students are in their thinking we have enough life experience to know this will pass unfortunately they don't the young man that I just told you about in Kansas City Kansas who committed suicide 15 year old young man mother had no idea this is a great tool to, to teach parents to ask their students or ask their children where are you on the anger meter today where are you on the depression meter where are you on the depression meter because if they're too high then you know as a clinician that you have to intervene alright so let's get to some meat you've had a little bit of salad so now let's get to the main course REBT has a um, the ABC's and A stands for the trigger event it's what happened don't spend a lot of time on what happened you don't have to in a counseling session you just need to get enough information to understand the situation B is the belief about what happened C is the emotional consequence how the client felt and D is the disputation so we're going to spend time today on the B C and D. F of course is the new feeling. So this is what I want to share with you just real quick. We have to first of all teach our students about the BC connection. That is the notion that how you feel is attached to what you're thinking. How you feel is attached to what you're thinking. So when a client comes in, let's say it's the bully. Let's say they've been sent to your, to your office because uh, a teacher just saw a bullying event. You might ask him, how are you feeling right now? And uh, depending on what he says, then the follow-up question is, tell me what you're thinking as well. Because we want to teach, and you can use this for, as, for students as young as probably fourth grade. We want to teach them the notion that how you feel and how you think are related. Now, we're going to get to some thinking errors that a lot of bullies have. One of the things that you might want to do, let's say after this web conference, because we don't have time to do it right now, one of the things you might want to do is to brainstorm with your colleagues on what you think the bully is thinking and how they're feeling, what you think the target is thinking and how they're feeling because the disputation has to address the thinking. You understand what I'm saying? But we have to get the thinking uh, first. Four categories of irrational beliefs, awfulizing, demanding, low frustration tolerance and negative global self rating so when you are brainstorming with their with your colleagues because I know I'm moving fast when you're brainstorming with your colleagues you want to put the self-talk into one of these categories as an example bullies probably have a lot of what demandingness very good they probably also have a lot of low frustration tolerance I can't stand him. I'm the king of this, uh, this school. I'm on the football team. How dare he look at me? Where's the demandingness in that? He must not measure up. This particular student must not look at me. He must be punished. That's probably what a lot of bullies are saying. He must be punished. He doesn't deserve to walk the same hallway as I do. So when they're in your office, you want to listen to the story, but you're listening for self-talk that falls into one of these categories because that's where the intervention comes in. On the other hand, what self-talk do you think a bully has? 
I mean, a, uh, a target. What self-talk do you think a target has? Oh, it's so unfair the way they treat me. And it might be, but again, we're not judging the self-talk. We're just listening for it. It's so fair the way they're unfair, the way they're treating me. I can't stand it. I can't stand not being liked. I can't stand being teased by other people. Where does that fall? Low frustration tolerance. They're probably also saying something like, nobody likes me. I do everything wrong. I can't stand it anymore. Every, everybody hates me. Where does that fall? Negative global self-rating. So here's what you do with that. And again, it's important that you capture the self-talk. The best way to capture the self-talk, young people, is when they're in your office. You ask them, what were you thinking when that happened? Okay? You'll have a group of thinkers and you'll have a group of feelers. For the students who are more inclined to be thinkers, you ask them, what were you thinking when that happened? You may not use self-talk. They may not get that. What were you thinking? For the feelers, how were you feeling? So if you get the feeling first, then you back up and ask them, what were they thinking when they felt embarrassed, hurt, uh, disrespected? Okay, so you understand what I mean? So here are some strategies, because that is what this is all about. Have them write down their negative self-talk. Now, you don't call it negative self-talk. You ask them the question, what were you thinking when that happened, uh, when, when you were in front of that person who bullied you? How did you feel? What were you thinking? And they'll tell you, well, I was thinking that, you know, this is so, this is so unfair. This is not right the way they're, t they're, uh, they're treating me. You know what? I want you to take a few minutes and write down everything that you were thinking. All right? What you want to do, and the reason for this is, first of all, when you write things down, it looks different on paper than when it's rolling around in your head. So you want to get them to write their words down. Now, you may write it down at the same time, but you want them to write it down. I used to have a whiteboard in my um, office when I was a school counselor. And sometimes I would write it on the board because you will get those students who don't want to write, who kind of poo poo this. You know, Miss D, what are you talking about? Well, just tell me what you were thinking. If they don't know, then the prompt question is, well, you know, if I were in that situation, I probably would be thinking, and then you say what you think. Write it down on your whiteboard. You're looking at the whiteboard now. What does that do? It takes the attention off of that subject, off of that client, and onto the whiteboard. So now both of us are collaborating with this issue instead of me directly uh, confronting you. With teenagers, that is so important, and with young students, because you feel self-conscious, as if you have done something wrong when you take a direct frontal approach. So having them write it down allows you to, ver to divert the uh, energy to the paper instead of to the person. So the first thing is write out what they're thinking. As an example, I had a young lady that I worked with this last summer. I'll call her Bambi because she was a sweet girl, beautiful uh, African-American young lady, tall and lanky, about 15 years old. And she was getting teased because she was tall and lanky. So it, there was some truth to the bullying, but there was a lot of jealousy on the other girl's parts because she was so pretty. Uh, she kind of looked like a Na Naomi Campbell but 15. So she had actually attempted suicide. And what happened is that one of her teachers, who I had um, been friendly with at this school, he and I kind of were colleagues, and he liked the work that I did with the children. He emailed me and said, uh, Miss D, I have a student who I'm really concerned about. I hear that she has uh, tried to commit suicide before. And I, um, I see in the class that she's sad and sullen, always puts her head down. And I, you know, just tested it and asked the students to do an assignment, an assignment. 
and she wrote a very disturbing statement saying that she doesn't want to live anymore. Sidebar, if you're a teacher or you're working in a school, if you're concerned about a student, have the whole class do an essay. Tell me what you're thinking today. If a lot of you are on a nine on the anger meter, tell me what's going on. Have them write. You know, that's an academic <laughs> lesson right there. We need better writers. But that is a way for them to anonymously self-report to you that they are struggling. So be sure to share that with your teachers. Anyway, he was a student enough to go ahead and do that kind of assignment. And when he read her, her uh, essay, that's when he, actually, he Facebooked me. So Facebook does have its place. Anyway, so I, I began to see her. The first thing I do with everybody is I have them write down their thoughts. And we began to look at her, um, her self-talk. One of her uh, negative self-talk statements was, they are teasing me because I'm skinny. Well, the fact is that she was skinny. So we created what I call a finish the sentence exercise that said, yes, I am skinny. However, I want to become a model and this is going to work in my favor. So that's just a sidebar in terms of the value of having them write down their self-talk because you can come up with creative on the spot interventions that you may not have thought about if you're doing all the work. You know, you have to get your clients to work just as hard as you do. All right, so journaling. 10 of your peers. If 10 of your peers were in the same situation as you were, and let's take um, Bambi as the example. If 10 of your peers had been um, bullied the same way that you were, how do you think they would have responded? The point of that question is to get her to see that not everybody responds in the same way. Not everybody would take it to the level of wanting to harm themselves, which is where she was. She was so self-conscious. So I said to her, Bambi, if two of your peers would have ignored it, what's the difference between how you handled it and how they, hand they would have handled it? And then she had to think about that for a second. And she said, well, Misty, I guess it's, you know, just they were able to let it roll off. Exactly. And that's what we're going to help you to do. So then we talked about the circle. Now the circle, let's see, I don't think I brought any paper. The circle is where you just draw a circle on a piece of paper. Actually, Tom, if you, I do have paper. <laughs> I don't have my pen. Just real quick. You draw, thank you. You just draw a circle on a piece of paper. Just like this, all right? And what you ask the client to do is to list using a negative for all of the things that they don't like about themselves. Now, when you're working with a bully, uh, or a target rather, you know that they'll have a lot of negatives. There are a lot of things they don't like about themselves. When you're working with a bully, what will they have? A lot of positives because they think they're all that in a bag of chips. They don't think what they're doing, there's nothing wrong with what they're doing. But what you want to do is to have them draw this circle and put in, list all their negatives, and this, that's what I had uh, Bambi do, list all her negatives. She had a bunch of them. And then we began to list the things that she liked about herself with pluses. All right? She only came up with two at the beginning. And then I tried to help her. Well, you want to become a model, so actually being skinny is an advantage, right? I had to help her with that. What we did from this intervention, from the circle intervention, number one, we processed at that time the fact that she does have some positive qualities. But you know what else we did? No, you don't know. We did a circle for the bully because in her mind, the bully was the devil, was the worst person on earth. This was a girl that she couldn't stand because this girl was causing her pain. I get that. But what we did is I had her do a circle on the bully. What do you think are some positive qualities of the bully? What do you think are some negative qualities? 
And then we compared the circles. What did we see? Well, she has things to work on the same as I do. Now, that does not excuse the bully, not at all. But what it did in her mind is humanize this person. Because as far as she was concerned, this person had a tail and horns. I mean, she was a demon. But what it did is humanize the bully so that she began to see this bully is just like me. So maybe she's not as powerful as what I have been thinking about in my head. That what I think was the turning point for her. Because as we began to work, and I worked with her about uh, six to eight weeks, as we began to work together, every session we did an activity like this, but we began to really focus on the positive qualities, her positive qualities. And she began to feel better about herself. Another thing that we did is I asked her to, if she were an animal, what would she be? And if the bully was an animal, what would the bully be? She said that she would be a butterfly and the bully would be a tiger or a lion, I think she said. Well, we used a visualization about the butterfly being able to get away from the lion. So you see, the work that I did with her initially about being able to visualize and do the deep breathing came back to this area. Now, we also talked about, from an analogy standpoint, how butterflies are able to get in places that lions can't. We talked about how pretty butterflies were. We talked about all of the positive characteristics of butterflies. So she began to feel really good about herself. And to make a long story short, she was able to feel better about herself. We developed a comeback for the bully. We also talked about practical ways of staying away from the bully, maybe hanging back in class for a few minutes, allowing the bully to go ahead to class, and that way they're not always confronting each other during class periods. But eventually the girl moved on to another, well, I don't know what happened to the bully. All I know is that she was able to really feel good about herself, and she turned the corner by doing that exercise. So the circle is really powerful because it tells people that we are all struggling with something. That, Tom, do we have any questions, or should I keep going? The one that's come in so far was looking for uh, contact information on the, the person in Carney that you referred to pretty early on. Is that available to people, or is it something you'll have to contact? email me because I don't have that information readily available with me right today. Um, but if you email me, I will certainly forward your email on to her. Okay, and she can give you some of those. Um, uh, I guess it's uh, practical school-wide. It's that primary intervention. That's a school-wide procedures that are important in terms of managing bullying. Just let me say something about that. To really have a strong bullying program, you have to have primary intervention, which is school-wide. You have to have something done in the classroom. And then, of course, today we're talking about individual strategies or the tertiary intervention, which is the one-on-one. -on -one. But to have an effective program at your school, you really need to deal with all of those areas. Uh, my specialty is in the counseling strategies as well as the classroom strategies. There is so much that I would love to share with you. I can only get a few things in in the hour that we're talking about. I know I'm talking fast, but I'm trying to really share as much information with you as I can. So it's, you know, one of the things that we have to deal with. All right, last strategy on this slide, big eye. Now, big eye is very similar to drawing the circle, where you draw an eye, the letter I, on a piece of paper, just a white piece of paper. And what you want to do in the big eye is, again, define some traits that she would like to get better at and traits that she wants to um, continue to strengthen. And what you're doing in the big eye, very similar to the circle, 
is that you're defining, you, you want her to, the target, this is mostly for the target, you want them to see that they are not one of their traits. For example, a lot of um, targets may feel like they are socially inadequate. They don't uh, make small talk well. They don't socialize well. And when you do the big eye, little eye, the big eye is the big picture. That's all of who you are. This ability to socialize is just one little um, chicken scratch in the big picture. It doesn't make you who you are. See, what happens when a person is being bullied is that they begin to define themselves by their inadequacies. On the other hand, the bully begins to define him or herself by his entitlement, by his strengths. So with the bully, it might be better to use the circle because they'll have a lot of pluses in the circle. The question is, do you have some things that you need to work on? Are there some areas of weakness that you have? Hopefully they'll come up with some negatives. If they don't, you need to help them with that, okay? Because they're a little too uh, egotistical. Then you have them do a circle on the person that they continually target. What's the difference between the two of you? We are all trying to do the best that we can in this world. It is very difficult to teach bullies how to have empathy. This is a start. The second way, and this is mostly about bullies now, because bullies do have that sense of entitlement, and sometimes that entitlement comes from what's called thinking errors. This is from the CBT methodology. In my book, um, the Activities Manual, I have a whole section on thinking errors. And this is what I would suggest. First of all, we have self-centered thinking. So when I'm working with a bully, I, again, we're looking at the, uh, the sheet. I'm not calling him, you are a self-centered, selfish, mean person. You know, that's not appropriate. We want to keep that unconditional positive regard, even with bullies that we don't like. Hey, I've been there. I understand. So it's much easier to work with something here. You know, a self-centered person. What is a self-centered person? It's a person who only thinks about themselves. What kind of person do you think, what, what would that look like here in this school? You understand where I'm going with this, right? We're trying to get the bully to basically describe himself but he won't necessarily know that. But what he will do, hopefully, is that as you have conversations about being self-centered and what does that look like, he will begin to reflect on his behavior and consider, huh, maybe the person that I described is kind of like me. You can add your yeast to the bread mix and describe him for him, not using his name. Okay. I wonder if a self-centered person would bully a, a student who is really new here and, you know, maybe be maybe feeling really uncomfortable. Perhaps that person is minimizing. That's the next one. Minimizing. Minimizing means just like on your screen, on your computer screen, minimizing means making something smaller. Perhaps he is making it seem less significant than it really is. He's minimizing how that other person feels. So the thinking errors of the bullies have to, when you're working with bullies, you really have to work with something that is, uh, again, not directly focused at them because they won't accept that. Most bullies think that they are in the right, okay? So you can't treat it head on. The other way, well, first of all, let me, let me continue with these. So we have self-centered thinking. You know what that is. That's when you are thinking only of yourself. Minimizing is when um, you are calling something smaller than it is. For instance, oh, all I did was just um, brush past him in the hallway when in actuality he knocked the boy down. Okay, that's minimizing. Um, assuming the worst, that's more of a target uh, uh, thinking error. 
because the target is thinking that just because this group of students doesn't like me, nobody likes me. And then blaming others, that is a bullying behavior or a thinking error because the bully is not thinking that they have done anything wrong. So they blame others. We are almost winding down. I want to get to the bystander, but one thing that you might want to do is use peer pressure when you're having them look at their thinking errors. Again, not looking at it or addressing it head on. So you have a group, maybe it's in a classroom, and you have a discussion with the students about what is self-centered thinking? What is um, minimizing? Has anybody minimized your behavior? Or have you done that to somebody else? You're trying to get some peer pressure to bring to bear for that bully so that they begin to see the behavior as inappropriate. Bystanders, how do you work with bystanders? I would work with bystanders in a group and again using the this strategy that I just shared with you in a classroom having a discussion about what they say does matter these are some thinking errors of a bystander why don't they report why don't they say something at the time of the event because they first of all they don't want to be targeted but secondly they say uh, it doesn't matter what I say. You know, that kid, he's kind of a geek. He probably deserved it. And it's really no big deal. What thinking error is that? What does that sound like? Minimizing. So you can use these um, words, put them, just put them on flashcards. You can use them in your classroom to have a discussion about what this looks like. Finally, I want to get to reality therapy. We Depp. This is on my website, so if you want to go to my website, secondwindcc.com, you can download the um, handout that a colleague of ours created on how to do this we dip. This is really great for the bully. The W stands for what do you want. The D stands for what are you doing. E is for the evaluation, and P is for the plan. When you have a bully in your office, what you want to do is ask them, what do you want? You want to stay on the football team? Well, what you're doing, which is continuing to be aggressive with this student, is going to cause you to get kicked off the football team. So let's look at why you continue to do that, and, and that's less important than coming up with a plan. You don't necessarily want to get into why you're doing it because then you'll have a long drawn out explanation that is basically a rationalization but the point is you come up with a plan on how you can behave differently so that you are moving closer to what you want with the we dep you have to make sure that the student has some type of motivation many times if it's a socially rejected bully they don't want to they enjoy the power that they get from the bullying situation. That is why it's so difficult to uh, treat bullying behavior. But if they have numbers three through five, if they say, I might try, I will try, I will do my best or I'll do whatever it takes, perhaps because they want to stay on the football team, then that level of motivation is an indicator that this is a good, solid plan the we debt will work for them and then you want to be sure to check with them within that week to see how they're doing on the plan so you don't want to just give them a plan and then not check with them for a month you have to rein that bully in because again you're trying to change behavior and that takes time but you want to reinforce what they're doing well and make sure that they are staying on track I don't think I have time for this last strategy, but it's called building an emotional vocabulary. Um, you can get a game called Moods, just M-O-O-D-S. This is by Hasbro. You can get it at Target or Walmart. And it has cards in the game that have all different kinds of moods. You can use this to help your clients build their emotional vocabulary so that they can better describe how they're feeling. So. <laughs> I think I have one minute left, and I have just whizzed through this information. But, uh, Tom, I'm going to turn it over to you.
<laughs> All right. Well, I have one question in the box so far, uh, and that this woman says that she has two bullies at school who bully each other. They each think they are the victim. Yeah. Would you address them as the victim or as the bully? That is a great question, and I think I would treat them or address them as both based on the situation that was in front of me. So let's say one day they were the bully, then I would address them as the bully. If they have the same event and they bullied and then were bullied, um, I think I would probably address their aggressive behavior first. But that victimization, that, that helplessness of, oh, you know, I, it's poor me, that is just as um, debilitating as the aggressive part of it. So that's a difficult one, um, but I would try to at, le at least make sure they were safe, not fighting, and then, you know, try to come at it based on what was in front of me. So I, I hope that helped. <laughs> I think it did. Well, they see you should pack an awful lot of information oh. into an hour's time. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> I'm exhausted. <laughs> <laughs> Folks, it comes no surprise that Daisy is actually available if, you, if you'd like to use her as a, a keynote presenter or to speak in an upcoming professional development training. You can reach her through the website, which is secondwindcc.com. Mm -hmm. It's secondwind, all spelled out, S-E-C-O-N-D-W-I-N-D-C-C.com. And we'll also send that link to you in, a, in our follow-up email. A couple of quick points before we send you away. We will send you a follow-up email that has a link to an evaluation. In that evaluation, we're going to ask you if you would like us to send your email address to Dacia and make that available to her so you can get onto her newsletter. Uh, we don't generally get rid give people emails out without your permission. So please give us that explicit permission if you'd like to be on her email, email list. Uh, also, we have already recorded a previous DVD with her, and there's a link to it on the on the website below there. It's called Youth at Risk DVD. That's available through our website. She, of course, has stuff available through her website. And our next video web conference is next Friday. It's at 1 o'clock, not 1.30 Central Time, and it's called Hearth and Housing. That will also originate here. And that's the beginning of, beginning of the wrap-up process of the Department of Mental Health's transformation grant, their five-year transformation process. Take a look at the website. We also just sent out a note about that one, but we'll have more information about that on the website as well. And so with that, <laughs> I'll take a deep breath. <laughs> what was that uh, the breathing exercises that we all need to do? I want to thank everyone out there for being a part of this program thank today. You. We had a fantastic crowd. And Desia, yeah. excellent job again. Thank, thank you so you, much. Thank you. Thank you for having me.